All right, welcome. Hi. This is Bogdan. This is Christian. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about our research on open source sustainability and how we use a large amount of trace data to find interesting things. Let's do it. So we want to talk about open source sustainability. I don't think we really need to under, uh, introduce the challenges, right? We all know this is hard. But I think there's also the insight that there's a huge amount of trace data in there that we can study and where we can find lots of interesting things that make us learn more about problems and possible solutions. Mm -hmm. and what we want to do in this talk is talk a little bit about how we are using large amounts, many terabytes of trace data to study open source and some of the findings that we have found. Done this for years now. A bit of a disclaimer: we are both academics. We teach at Carnegie Mellon. Um, this is a picture from Carnegie Mellon. These are our ivory towers. Although these days, I think this is more what our research looks like, and this is these are our ivory towers. But the important part here, I think, is we're here at this conference because we want to share some of the results, and we, more importantly, we want to learn from you, right? So we want to engage with the community, study some of the problems, bring some of the results into the community. About our incorrect assumptions or about some problems, some other problems that you're facing that we haven't considered and so on. So open source has changed over the last couple of years, uh, decades, right? It used to be kind of this hippie thing, maybe in the 90s or even 80s. Uh, rich white guys with a lot of spare time would hack on some software. And long hair. Um, and things have changed. First of all, open source has become way more popular, right? It's so much open source out there and it's so broadly used. There's nobody questioning this anymore. Mm -hmm. But there's also a rise of social coding platforms like uh, GitHub has really popularized this. Everybody has a GitHub profile these days, right? It's your CV uh, according to some. You can learn a lot of the about the project. So if you're thinking about adopting one of these projects, you can learn so much with just a glance on the project page, how many contributors, how active is it, right? How recently, who's working on this, what else are they doing? And people, studies have shown people use this actually to make decisions, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's very different. Uh, there's a lot of information available. I heard you can't get an interview unless you have a GitHub profile. In some places, unfortunately. Um, it's also really complicated, lots of, um, well, not complicated, but lots of dependencies, right? So no project is an island anymore. You, every project depends, or nearly every project depends on many others and on any other contributors there. Um, this is most visible when it breaks down, mm -hmm. right? So the Heartbleed case is very common where um, this project that was universally used by so many other projects had maybe three half-time maintainers had a bug and it affected everybody, mm -hmm. right? The, um, left pad issue is equally well known, right? So this is actually visible when it's breaking, but there's lots of challenges. We are depending so much on software that's maintained by others, mm -hmm. right? Layers and layers. And then also the nature of the game changes. We have lots of volunteers working together with professional developers, paid developers, right? We see an increasing commercialization and professionalization, even in the in the volunteer communities, we see more process, more governance, and then we see lots of companies, big companies, small companies, startups that uh, make money with open source, that donate their, donate their code as open source, that have their own software release it for others to use, mm -hmm. right? And what happens is that volunteers and paid developers work together, sometimes better, sometimes this is causing conflicts, um, right? And actually these projects, there's this notion of um, catastrophic success of an open source project, um, where a project that you start as a volunteer suddenly becomes so popular that everybody depends on it, right? And it's suddenly used in critical places where you didn't depend on this, uh, where, where you didn't expect it. Um, an extreme case is here maybe Apache Struts, which was blamed publicly by Equifax when Equifax got hacked three years ago, right? So this big company um, never donated to open source that didn't contribute to this project, was using this in all parts of their system publicly in the news blamed this open source project for the attack. It's actually interesting, you should go and read the congressional report that actually tells a much more nuanced story. Yes, there was a vulnerability, but there were so many issues in uh, how Equifax internally, internal process and structure and things like this. Um, it's a example, fascinating reading, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, and this brings me to this 
point that the Equifax cases may be a little bit extreme, but think about the poor maintainers in the those are consultants who are doing this as part of their work, right? But being blamed, being in the national news for this. Mm. But we hear stories over and over again how people complain about their workload, about being burned out, about toxicity in the interactions that they have with the community. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it's really turning off some contributors. Um, and there's really questions here, how can we make this a welcoming and sustainable community? Mm. Right? So there are lots of questions here, lots of challenges, what are best practices that we can recommend, what works, what doesn't work, what really helps for sustainability, mm -hmm. right? Things are changing all the time, we need to change our practices. But don't people have lots of opinions about these? Yeah, um, and often good uh, opinions, right? From experience, from their projects, from other projects that they know. But a lot of this is anecdotal evidence, mm -hmm. right? We, we saw this in a lot of studies when we talked to developers. Uh, they know very well, they have opinions why they're doing this, and they can point to other projects where this has been successful, but they rarely ever have a really good overview of all the design decisions, mm -hmm. and they rarely ever have evidence behind what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where science can actually help. Right? That, that's we can, exactly right. We can go beyond just anecdotal evidence. This is actually a great research opportunity here. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last few years uh, on this. Um, and you know, the fact that the practices have been more standardized since GitHub uh, existed, uh, most people are using Git now for their version control, they're contributing through this pull request model. Uh, everybody has these uh, profile pages uh, rich with information. All of this is sort of more or less standardized and uniform by now. This makes it a lot easier for people like us, for researchers, to mine and analyze this kind of data. Um, and there's lots of it, okay? I don't know if you know this, but there's uh, yeah. 50 million people, 50 million people, okay? That's twice the size of Romania. Uh, 50 million people on GitHub, over 100 million repositories as of last year. And many of them are active. Not all of them, but a large number. Many are active, that's right. Um, um, some colleagues at the University of Tennessee tried to quantify how much disk space all of these public Git repositories on the internet take, and they came to a, a, a petabyte or two of, of storage uh, uh, more than a year ago, so it's probably much, much bigger by now. Just for comparison, this is already bigger than Wikipedia. And you know, the thing is, this is a really great opportunity for research, right? Having access to this big, rich data set, because you can go from you know, anecdotes and small scale studies that people may have done, you can go from these to something much, much bigger, something that's much more likely to generalize to a large population like here. Um, for example, right, you could do a census of all the donation platforms across all of GitHub, and we've done this, and you know, we found that PayPal is maybe the most popular, and uh, Patreon and others are, are, are used as well. We're going to talk about this a bit more, yeah. We're going to come back to this. Mm -hmm. uh, another really cool thing is that all of this data is timestamped, is longitudinal, okay? So, you know, think of commits and issues and what have you, emails, whatever, uh, messages, communications, all of this is timestamped. Mm -hmm. So you can reconstruct the, the timeline of all of these events, and you could reason about you know, changes to files, for example, or reason about people joining or leaving projects based on, of, based on these traces and, and, and these timestamps of events. Uh, to give you another example, okay, the way we found these, um, these donation platforms is by tracking the history of changes to people's readme files in their repositories, because that tells us exactly uh, be, because they um, mentioned their donation platforms in their GitHub readmes, we could tell exactly when they started using any particular platform, because there's a commit that's introduced that link uh, in there. And even which maintainers introduced it. And even which maintainer introduced this. Um, and this way we can begin to understand these trends over time, and we can begin to reason about how some things are, uh, have changed and which things are popular and so on. Um, and that is really useful. But so. This is all great, and you can you know, uh, describe and begin to understand the ecosystem this way. But what if you want to actually do something about sustainability? What if you want to, I don't know, design a new intervention to make open source more sustainable? Everybody should learn to juggle. Christian keeps saying this. Yeah. Christian keeps saying that everybody needs to learn how to juggle, and I tend to disagree. And you know, to resolve this dispute between us, like, what can you do? You can, you can run this as a medical trial, as an experiment. So you, for example, would randomly assign uh, maintainers to either juggle or not, 
and you could see, you know, you could measure them before and after, and you could see kind of if there's any effect in the group that learn how to juggle, if their projects are more sustainable, if they're happier and less likely to burn out. Okay, um, except you know we can't really do this um, because while well, juggling is really boring, okay. hey, hey. and because it's uh, not always practical to run experiments in, in this way, but we could do something um, that tries to get as close to this as possible. We could um, think of these different things that people may have, uh, think of these possible interventions as natural interventions. Chances are that somebody somewhere in this giant ecosystem has tried this before. And in fact, chances are there's sufficiently many of them. And you could actually, using statistics, right, instead of random assignment, we can't really do random assignment. By using statistics, we could begin to separate the effects of, say, juggling, right, whatever favorite inter intervention you have from these other things that are correlated. This is where the analogy breaks down because it's hard to detect who's juggling. But things like tool adoption, donations, there are lots of interventions that mm -hmm. you can study. So, uh, this is all great, but it, there's no free lunch. Um, we could spend literally uh, all day uh, talking about all the ways in which you could misinterpret our, this data or all the ways in which it's noisy. Just to give you one example, say you're looking at uh, this uh, contribution graph of, uh, of a maintainer. Would this tell you that this is a very sustainable project? Almost 6,000 contributions last year. But there's no single day in which they took a break. They've been active the whole year. It seems pretty exhausting. Well, it turns out this is actually not a, not a human. It's a, it's a bot. <sighs> Shopping. So the, the point here is that there are so many of these gotchas um, that if you just sort of um, blindly uh, mine and analyze this data, chances are you would uh, arrive at the wrong conclusions just because of all this immense noise. And you know, we've spent years cleaning and so on, understanding these, and we're still. Uh, and you find some results in any noise. You find, right, so that's the thing, okay? So with data sets this big, you always find some results somewhere. There's always a correlation somewhere. You always detect something. So how do you actually know if it's, if it's real or not, right? For example, the data could show you that this particular person dropped out uh, at some point because the number of commits they were making uh, just dropped significantly. Okay. How do you actually know what happened? Okay. So the only way to do this, you can't just by looking at this data. The only way to do this is to go beyond and to look at, for example, decades of literature in the social sciences, people that have studied turnover and other things, group dynamics and team composition and all these things. Or actually about, ask them. Right? Or you could just ask them. Yeah, why not? Um, okay, so that's about it in terms of methods. Let's actually look at some concrete examples of research findings from these different studies that we've done over the years. And we've done quite a few of these. Um, we won't have time to cover all of these. Um, and, and so many other researchers have done other studies. But we, we're just picking a few examples, right? Things that we think are interesting to share. And we want to start with donations. All right, let's start with the first thing. Um, we already mentioned donations, right? Um, there's lots of discussions of open source and money, and it's kind of controversial. Um, this is actually interesting. This is Nadia Ekbal's uh, Lemonade Stand, a guide to all the different or many different approaches to fund open source. And there's so many different approaches, including consulting and donations and crowdfunding and selling books and uh, just being part of a larger company. But we wanted Do to look work? at we wanted to look at donations, right? So um, this is still controversial, what works, what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, donations are getting extremely popular. GitHub itself has integrated a feature where you can ask for donations on GitHub itself. I've seen that, yeah. Right? Um, but whether it really works, what's the effectiveness, that's kind of still controversial. And we also won't have a final solution here. But you see lots of anecdotes, right? People who are really happy about receiving donations and funding this. Mm -hmm. People are really critical about this. Um, people are frustrated about not sustaining their work even mm -hmm. though they want. Um, there's prior work on this showing that even popular projects often only get very small amounts of donations when they're asking, often beyond below the US poverty line, for example. So you couldn't fund your lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, of this. And it's certainly below typically industry standards, mm -hmm. right? 
There's a question of whether you should fund your lifestyle through open source. It's maybe a separate question, but if you wanted to, could you? Mm -hmm. right? So there are lots of things to explore. Here are just a couple of things that we looked in in our study, um, like how prevalent are donations? Who's receiving donations? What is the money used for? Are they effective? Right? And the study is actually more complicated. We looked at many different data sources, like all the data from GitHub, a huge amount of readmes, um, project metrics. Uh, we also looked at lots of donation pages, mm -hmm. kind of read through a lot of things. Also, the research methods are different. But let me just show you some results. As shown earlier, we, we used mainly readme pages to quantify how often do people ask for not donations. Right? We find, as Bogdan has shown earlier, that donations are common. There are platforms that are common. But it's also, as we know already, um, not a lot of projects that ask for donations get large amounts of mm -hmm. donations. Right? Actually, a good chunk uh, of projects where we can observe this with Patreon or Open Collective actually don't receive any motivation. Mm -hmm. Just think about this. If you, as a maintainer, ask for a donation and nobody's responding. Mm -hmm. Um, there's much more analysis that we can do. We've, for example, looked at who's asking for a uh, donation and who's receiving donations. In a paper, you see a lot of kind of statistics here. I'm not going to go into the details. It looks a lot like this. Uh, but I want, just want to show you some of the results. For example, the projects that are asking for donations, compared to all the other ones that are not asking, right? The mass majority is not asking. Mm -hmm. The projects that are asking for donations tend to be more active and more popular. So they already have a platform when they're asking. But they also tend to be somewhat smaller and personal accounts rather than organizational accounts, indicating that the very large and popular projects, they probably don't fund themselves that much through donations, or they already have organizations that provide some other form of support. Right? So there's a certain niche here. But if we try to understand which projects actually get um, more donations than others of the ones that are getting any, the signals become really thin. Um, it's not that we see very clear trends. The only trend that remains is kind of popularity. Projects that have more stars, projects that have more downloads, those tend to be the ones that are more successful in gaining donations. But otherwise, there are no really large trends. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to study more, to identify good fundraising uh, strategies, mm -hmm. for example, beyond just uh, platform trends. We also looked a little bit into what do people expect to get from donations. This is by reading the descriptions. Actually, a lot of people don't say anything, but among the people who say something, they often talk about engineering. They talk about community, supporting their community, supporting project expenses like server costs, or even just personal expenses, like I need to pay back my student loans, mm -hmm. right? rather than saying I want to invest in a certain feature. Um, in a couple of platforms, especially Open Collective, we can observe how the money is spent. And this is also interesting. There are a number of interesting insights. So a lot of projects get way more donations than they are spending. Right? Not, a, not a lot, but um, actually a lot of projects are savers especially if they get a small amount of don donations. They seem to amount, uh, kind of accumulate this for rainy days, maybe. Um, and the expenses that they're using on is largely engineering, especially projects that get quite a bit of donations of poverty line level. They actually pay mostly for engineering mm -hmm. uh, projects in smaller um, settings to find services. But again, we, we have some initial observations, right? We can control for a lot of data here. We are pretty confident that certain trends persist across all the work. And a lot of things don't persist. But there's also a huge amount of room for more, and especially bringing in theory. Right? We talked about this before. There's a huge amount of knowledge about fundraising in philanthropy. Right? I was going to ask, is there anything that people can do to be more effective? So, so looking in the literature, there are a couple of things. Right, So the reputation matters for charities. And so this is what we see here, right? So more popular projects, more active projects, they tend to uh, attract more donations. This is probably a reputation mechanism. Mm -hmm. But the literature also talks about awareness for needs. And this is something that we don't see people doing a lot of, kind of really explaining why they do uh, need not uh, 
donations what they need it for, right? So some projects explain this, but the vast majority does not. Mm -hmm. And the efficiency of using funds is also something that has been studied a lot in traditional uh, philanthropy, uh, like effective altruism, things like this, right? So this is something that has, we haven't seen much attention to actually explaining uh, beyond kind of open, uh, patria, open collective kind of data, what uh, money was used for, what it, was it successful, and so on. You mean giving a, a report back to the, the, the donors? Right. So some projects do this, but I think it's not as common as we might expect mm -hmm. in other areas. And there's also a dark side to donations, which is pretty well understood. If, for example, if you give people a little bit of money, they turn from self-motivated volunteers into underpaid employees, right? And this can actually be demotivating. That's how I feel in my day job. <laughs> right. So let me move on to, to a different topic. A key to us being able to study the how people use these donation platforms was the fact that they uh, were mentioning them in their readme files. And often it was through these, these badges that you see there embedded in, in these readme files that we were able to detect which services people are using. Now, this is actually really interesting if you think about it a little bit because uh, transparency and so the, the, all these social features are already so fundamentally uh, part of the platform. They're a defining characteristic of the platform and the environment by themselves. But this goes beyond. This is more than just what the platform directly provides. This is stuff that people deliberately uh, uh, customize and add to their own projects and add to their readme files, okay? So, you know, you can see all kinds of these different badges. Uh, uh, there's a whole variety of them that people uh, adopt and embed in their readme files. Mm -hmm. And, and presumably they're trying to signal something to to their audience and their users. Yeah, I mean, I can see high test coverage here, right? Uh, they use continuous integration. This tend to be good signs for a project, right? Right, right. So we actually wanted to study this more rigorously to see uh, what, if any, effects doing this has on these communities and these projects. So um, let's go back to the beginning when we we're talking about these, uh, these time series and the longitudinal nature of the data, okay? So here, let's say we're interested in studying um, what the effect of adopting or, or displaying this dependency management badge is. Okay? The fact that all of this data is versioned allows us to reason about this over time. So what I'm showing you here is, I'm showing you how fresh people's dependencies are in a particular project on average. The lower is better here, the lower the fresher. Okay? And I'm showing this uh, over uh, a period of time, before and after they started managing their dependencies and displaying these badges in their readings, mm -hmm. okay? And you can see in this one project that I'm showing here how after they started doing this, their dependencies got all of a sudden much, much fresher, okay? So now here's the, the cool uh, thing. If you take all of the projects that adopted the same badge, it doesn't matter when that happened, okay? But because you have this intervention that they were all exposed to, think of this badge as an mm -hmm. intervention, Right? You can then align all of these different time series and sort of look at these trends in aggregate over the entire uh, sample or population. And this is how you get from anecdotes to entire trends. That's right. So you could have these entire distributions of these values of these dependency freshness metrics computed over large samples, There's thousands and thousands of projects represented here, and you could see whether there's any common trends uh, across all of them. But it's actually, it goes beyond just visualizing the data. Okay. We can actually um, model this more precisely using statistics, and we could actually quantify and we can measure you know, if there's any change in the slopes of these time series before and after the intervention, if there's any change in the level, like was there any big jump around the time when they did this, did the trend afterwards change compared to the one before, et cetera. Lots of things like this that we could, we could quantify and measure very precisely. And you can control for other effects, like the popularity of the project may have just skyrocketed in the time and that maybe that was the effect. Right? That's the beauty, right? So if you're doing this carefully, you could, you could separate the effects of this particular thing as, as, as much as possible from other things that might be correlated, like popularity, like you said. So we've, we've done this, and again, I, uh, I won't go into all of these details here, but let me just show you some of the conclusions from, from our analysis, and you can find more details in our papers about these. If we're looking at, say, dependency management and these dependency manager badges, okay, um, you can see that after people start doing this, across this large sample, thousands and thousands of projects, 
you can see this consistent effect, right? Their dependencies are consistently more up to date uh, when they do this. It's a really good practice. Mm -hmm. uh, probably also more secure because they keep you know, fixing these uh, vulnerabilities, presumably. Um, uh, an interesting thing there, uh, if you look at how this evolves over a longer period of time, uh, there's nine months being shown here, actually you could see it starting to trail off. So it seems like uh, after some time, uh, people stop paying as much attention to this as they were doing in the beginning. So it's really interesting to, to think about how you could make this even more sustainable and enforce this in a, in a longer period. But let me give you another example that's really fascinating. Maintainers complain often about their contributors maybe not submitting uh, tests together with their PRs. Okay, so how can you incentivize people to do this in a, as non-invasive uh, a way as possible. How to do this, okay? Take a look at this chart. The first half, okay, before they started displaying these badges, hardly anyone was ever submitting tests together with their PRs. In the second part here. Yeah. But in the second part, look how many more people started doing this and consistently afterwards. And this is... Why don't we affect us? That's the... Well, this is a success, right? Yeah, be because you know, there was such a small thing to change, right? You just you just signal that you care about testing and you care about quality. Hmm. Let me step back for a minute and talk a little bit about theory. Signaling theory is something that's not specific to badges. It's something that people have looked at uh, for a long time in other, uh, in other disciplines like economics and biology. And the theory explains how some type of signals are more reliable, more trustworthy than others. To give you an example, take the peacock and the peacock's fluffy, colorful feathers. Mm -hmm. okay. When the bird has those feathers up on display, uh, it becomes uh, more prone to being hunted by predators, it becomes slower and so on. But the fact that you see a bird that has survived despite this hardship, despite this handicap, right, that means that bird has a lot more energy and it's a, probably a much better mate. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, in the same way here, if you distinguish between the badges that have some kind of underlying analysis, that's you know compute the, the bill status or some test coverage metric or something, some kind of analysis that's harder to fake, from those that simply link to somewhere, but much easier to fake, you would expect to see stronger effects for these uh, assessment signals, they're called, the ones that have underlying analysis. And we're seeing this consistently in our data as well. So this means that, for example, um, whenever you can choose uh, what a, a flavor of a badge over another, right? So take the Slack, uh, the two Slack badges. One just points to a channel that people can join. The other one, in addition, also tells you how many people are active at any point in time, and mm -hmm. so it keeps updating this information, right? That one's harder to fake. It's more expensive, but it's also more trustworthy because it's more expensive and it's harder to fake. And you can use this for design, right? So if you go back to donations, it might actually be much smarter to actually show that you have a need for donations by some analysis, right, rather than just claiming donations requested. That's exactly the idea, right, that you could use this for design and you could design them in this particular way to make them most effective. Mm -hmm. um, another takeaway from this is you, know, you probably don't want to add too many. So we've, we've looked at the correlation between how many downloads these packages get and how many badges they were showing and we're controlling for other things that might uh, vary uh, alongside this. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing consistently in our models again is this very strong non-linear effect there, right? So there seems to be some sweet spot. It seems to be around five or so badges in our models. Mm -hmm. uh, but the point is that if you have too many, uh, it becomes counterproductive. It, it doesn't look as serious anymore and it's not attractive You want to signal the important things. Right? You want to signal the important things. Um, and finally, as you were talking about design, there's lots of these things that are uh, these qualities that people care about when they look at open source projects, that contributors care about when they look at open source projects, that are not currently as visible uh, as they could be. Mm -hmm. To give you one example, um, the tone of the community is something in our interviews with potential contributors, something that comes up time and again as being important when people decide whether or not to join a project, to contribute to a project, if they find the community welcoming and, and friendly. Mm -hmm. right? um, and you know, these days, there's all kinds of NLP techniques that, that could, could look at this with some accuracy, perhaps. But the point is, um, this is not something that's easily visible. Somebody will sort of have to read through these discussions to, to make this inference. Well, it could perhaps be made more visible through something like, like a badge. Mm -hmm.
Um, and there's others too. Like if you need help, if you want to attract new contributors, well, signal that explicitly. Mm -hmm. Signal that you're welcoming PR. You're asking for help. You're uh, you have 20 issues open that require somebody to to work on, and so on. Right. Mm -hmm. So you could make these things more visible. Just make it easier for people to find you. You know. There's also a dark side to all of this transparency. It's not all fun and games. Um, so you kind of always watched, right? Everything is public that you're doing. Yeah, and the fact that you have these profile pages that show your photo and your name and all kinds of information about you um, make you much more prone to whatever biases, implicit or explicit, uh, others might have. So um, to give you an example, we ran a survey a few years ago, and we asked people uh, how much they're aware of some of these personal attributes, some of these demographic attributes of each other, mm -hmm. um, despite these things, mind you, not being explicitly recorded, right? This is not even Your information pages, yeah. that's, that's part of your profile page, mm -hmm. right? Um, speaking of gender here in particular, there's no field to enter your gender in your GitHub page or, or similar, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and still, right, despite this, people infer this very commonly. In fact, in our survey data, much more commonly than they infer other qualities or other attributes, mm -hmm. right, from things like your name or your profile photo and so on. Okay. And, you know, some of the um, respondents to our survey also mentioned negative experience, says presumably because of this, right? So somebody mentioned explicitly that they changed their identity on the platform to appear so, so that people would assume they were a different gender. Okay, just because they were probably, uh, uh, I don't know, harassed or, or, or bothered by, by uh, others on the platform uh, because of this. Um, and you know, for talking about sexist behavior in particular, this is actually not new to open source. It's been documented for a long time. It's a, a well known study um, that. Uh, finds that sexist behavior in open source is as common as it is extreme. And this is a quote from that particular paper. Uh, and there's others too. There's a study that looked at how um, having uh, your uh, personal information be a part of your profile makes you more prone to, uh, to biases in your pull requests, uh, biases against you in your pull requests, uh, and so on. Um, and you know, probably by now, it wouldn't surprise you to, to learn that the um, gender diversity in open source in particular is much lower um, than in most other places in tech and, and the tech industry. This is really, really concerning and, and disappointing. Um, you know, companies like, um, uh, the big companies have higher gender representation than this, and this data is already a few years old. But platforms uh, like GitHub and Stack Overflow and open source more, more broadly very low, okay? Um, and this is really at odds with people's expectations. If you ask people you know, what is open source uh, culture like, then I think the most common answer you would get is that it's really a meritocracy, that nothing matters but the quality of your code, right? Code uh, sees no color or gender. It, it's how well you can, how much you can contribute uh, that, that matters, nothing else. Is this, I think, the mainstream perception. Mm -hmm. And this is just not true. So, um, Lots of these anecdotes. I think the mainstream one is that it's a meritocracy, but also uh, opposing views. Some people really embrace diversity and, and they think it's a positive and they're trying to encourage this. Uh, others uh, have had negative experiences because of diversity um, and uh, they're maybe discouraged by this. Uh, so lots of anecdotes again, like we've seen throughout. What about the evidence, right? What is the evidence? Is there any data to uh, inform this question either way? Is it that uh, more diverse teams tend to be more effective, or, uh, more diverse communities tend to be more effective, or is it the other way around, that it doesn't matter, or it, if anything, uh, even harmful? Uh, and uh, it, we, do find, we do find evidence in the data that diversity helps. And, and let me show you how we got mm -hmm. to this. So uh, if you think of this again as a natural experiment, right, um, you can mine lots of data from a large set of projects, uh, collaborative projects with, with different people collaborating, um, and you can compare their outputs. Okay? This is the way we're operationalizing uh, success or effectiveness here. You're comparing their outputs. You want to see 
if there's any difference in how much people produce per unit time and their output per unit time between the two conditions, between teams that are more diverse and teams that are less diverse. Okay? Um, and um, here we're looking at two dimensions of diversity. We're looking at diversity in terms of gender. Um, and I, and I want to um, note here that because of the, um, the name-based inference uh, that we're making for, for people's gender. We have to do it because of, there is no field, right? There is no field, yeah. So because there is no field, we have to infer gender in order to study this from people's names. Uh, and we can only do this for uh, the technology right now for name-based inference only allows binary inferences mm -hmm. with some accuracy. So I apologize to people that don't uh, identify as binary. We just don't have tools to study this, okay? Um, the other dimension is experience or tenure, right? You could think of teams where it's a whole bunch of senior people or a whole bunch of junior people or a mix between the two kinds of, of engineers and developers, mm -hmm. okay? So which one is more effective? So we're looking at how um, many commits these different teams make per unit time, mm -hmm. okay? That's the measure of output. How much stuff do they get done? How much code do they write per unit time, mm -hmm. okay? And you're probably gonna complain you're probably going to complain that this is overly simplistic, right? So because you know all kinds of other things matter and, and correlate with how um, quickly people get stuff done, right? Maybe they, they have more developers. Maybe the project is more popular mm -hmm. and more active. Uh, maybe on, on the contrary, maybe the project's old and um, has sort of slowed down development and whatnot, right? All of these things um, that you can complain are. Uh, correlating with, with how effective and productive they are, are actually things we can measure, though. We can measure in the data. And again, uh, coming back to this point I made earlier, we can try to separate the effect of one from the effects of the others. Mm -hmm. So what do we find? Okay, We find consistent evidence in the data across very large samples that uh, those teams that are more balanced, more diverse in terms of gender. Okay, So this means not any of, in this case, binary gender dominating, right? Just the balance of, of, mm -hmm. of the two. Uh, and similarly, in terms of experience, balance of junior and senior people, okay? those are the teams that are most effective. Even with controlling for all the obvious things. Even with controlling for the obvious things. And the obvious things behave as you'd expect. So, you know, larger teams and so on are, are more effective, mm -hmm. uh, just like you'd expect. But even mm -hmm. when controlling for all these other things, you still see some effect there for these diversity uh, variables. Right. And it's small, it's small in the data, um, mm -hmm. but it's there. And it fits the theory. And it fits the theory. So let me tell you about one more study. We looked at dropout and retention. Mm -hmm. um, and let's start from the observation in the data that um, women are more likely to drop out uh, after any time uh, spent in open source uh, than men are on average. And again, this is the same caveats about binary gender as before. And the effect is particularly strong early in the project. That's right. So here you see the probability of survival, uh, it's called it, just remaining active, uh, active and contributing to open source over time and how that varies between the two genders. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's actually really interesting theory, again, in the social sciences that explains how the very connections that people make over time and the very uh, nature of the projects and, and so on that they work on, the teams they uh, mm -hmm. they join over time, how those uh, connections in this network, how those explain this effect, mm -hmm. is really interesting. So let me let me tell you about this. So there's two kinds of this, uh, social capital theory. There's two kinds of this. One is about uh, bonding. This is about uh, so having cohesive teams and so being part of these uh, uh, tightly connected groups um, and how this uh, provides people with willingness to, to uh, continue and mm -hmm. just some sense of belonging and feel like you're part of something, a close network connection between all these people. Mm -hmm. And you can see how that would be beneficial. The counterpart to this is about learning about new opportunities or so bridging or getting out of your, of your bubble, your echo chamber, your cluster, right? learning about new things and, and branching out over time. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't happen through these tightly connected groups, right? Because people there probably know and have access to roughly the same information. It's through these weak ties that you learn about new opportunities typically. Okay, so both of these mechanisms 
would explain why some open source contributors mm -hmm. are uh, more active, or they're active longer term, rather, than others. That's right. Uh, yes, well, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see them in. But here's the catch, though. When you have such an imbalanced environment, like we do in terms of gender in open source, right? some of these network mechanisms might not be as beneficial as you would hope. In particular, you know, being part of these, or being a minority, rather, in these very tightly connected, very cohesive groups um, exposes you to higher risk of, of, of bias and potential discrimination, just because echo chambers are more likely to form among the majority group and, and these tightly connected uh, teams and projects. Mm -hmm. Think of politics. We, we see this all the time with sort of bipartisanship and bipartisanship in, in politics. Okay, So this would actually... Um, suggest that a way to fix this, right? If, if that's the case, if that's true, if there's any evidence for this, in, even in our data, a way to fix this would potentially be to break out of these clusters, mm -hmm. okay? By just sort of exposing yourself or, or uh, joining projects where you're more likely to encounter new people or new ideas or new technologies or what have you. Mm -hmm. But that would be a way to break out of these bubbles of these mm -hmm. echo chambers. But the question is, you know, does, it, does it happen? Is there any evidence for this in open source? But again, we can study this with data. And we've done this. We have a big sample of about 60,000 people. And again, similar modeling as before. And with all the, um, the controls and so on, the steps for cleaning and filtering that we talked about earlier. And we're seeing um, evidence for, for all of these. So first off, we're seeing here, um, this is a plot that shows how higher or lower lower cohesion in these projects uh, between the different contributors. So the bonding capital. The bonding capital, yes. Mm -hmm. How this correlates with uh, higher probability of, of survival or so mm -hmm. long-term contribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, So it's better for everyone. On average, people that are part of these more cohesive projects in communities, right. they stay engaged longer. Mm -hmm. Okay, Everyone benefits from this. Uh, and interestingly, we're seeing this gender interaction effect that we were hypothesizing. Mm -hmm. So what I'm showing you here is a, a, a little bit complicated, so bear with me for a second. What I'm showing you here is the difference in um, uh, engagement or survival probability between people that were part of teams uh, that are more diverse, project communities that are more diverse in terms of this information that they mm -hmm. have access to. And we're looking at the programming languages that people have had experience with before as a proxy for this. Mm -hmm. um, and what you're seeing across the board here for both genders is that everybody, again, benefits from this, mm -hmm. right? So like you would expect, this is a bridging kind of social capital. You learn mm -hmm. new things, and everybody benefits from this. The people, wider network. Yeah, but quite, exactly. Mm -hmm. The people that have had more of this, they tend to stick around mm -hmm. longer uh, when you, again, control for other uh, right. things. Okay, but the interesting part is that uh, women benefit from this more, and especially uh, after about a year or so of, of contributing to open source. I think that's when uh, having access to these new opportunities to, to continue your engagement, that's when it's most critical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this suggests, right, that we could be investing more deliberately into um, mentorship programs, for example. And design them deliberately. Exactly, that's the, that's the catch, right? So it's not just about having mentors, but it's about having the right mentors. That would the right opportunities, the right connections. Exactly, that would, that would expose you to these new ideas and these new opportunities and these new projects. Right? Again, we can learn from theory to design interventions, to design our communities. That's what we're finding here, yeah. That was a lot, right? Um, let's summarize. So we talked about sustainability. Uh, we talked about all the challenges that come there, right? Um, all the high workload, the stress, uh, the tension that comes. But we also have, I mean, we have only scratched the first surface, but we have shown you a couple of different things. Right? We have shown the limitations of donations as a sustainable funding source, whether good, whether bad, uh, how we can maybe use theory to improve uh, this. Badges as a transparent signaling mechanism, which is useful for designing lots of interventions, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, it's so easy. Yeah. Right. Um, the dark side to transparency, where you're always observed and uh, your work is observed, but also your personal characteristics mm -hmm. and that may affect how you work, um, but also um, how social capital theory re suggests really 
specific paths how you can improve community design and retention. Just, and just then, as one example, there are others. Right, right? and th th there's so much more, right? But equally importantly, this talk, we'd also try to give an overview of how we can go beyond anecdotes, right? So we've shown you multiple different research designs. Almost always we looked at terabytes of data, mm -hmm. right? T thousands of projects, long histories. Uh, we had to control for a lot of things. There's sometimes fancy statistics involved. Uh, but in general, the trend is always going from kind of anecdotes, what we find, what people are talking about, looking for trends, and then coming up hopefully with evidence and theory-based recommendations. Mm -hmm. And the goal here is for the entire community to go beyond just widen your horizon essentially, right? So don't just copy what you see other projects are doing. Don't just go off anecdotal evidence, mm -hmm. right? Actually look at evidence, look at the science, and hopefully the more we understand, we can actually intentionally design our tools and communities and design interventions and pick from a menu of possible things for the community and the specific goals that we have in mind, the right approach to go here. The ones that we, we expect are going to be most effective. Yep. Yeah. So there's much more research here. Here's just a couple more things that we have worked on. Um, there's much more out there. Um, we recommend to Google Scholar is a good source. Mm -hmm. uh, search for a couple of keywords here. There's lots of uh, research in this community. Researchers always appreciate uh, when practitioners talk about our papers, <laughs> pick us up, con contact us, um, right? And before I close, I just want to acknowledge this is always collaborative work with so many others, especially, especially Especially, I should highlight all the students that we worked on who do all the main brunt of the work, right? There are We're the heroes. real heroes here. Um, and finally, I think we need to go back to the point. We are always starting from what's the community talking about, right? So what are the sustainability challenges? How is open source changing? And we're here to listen as well. So we also want to know um, what are the sustainability challenges? What are anecdotal evidence that we should support, refute, uh, what are things that need to be studied mm -hmm. um, where we might have the data. Mm -hmm. And that's all that is. First try recording. Now get out of my bedroom. First try recording. First try recording. First try recording. I guess in the meantime, we can pick up the discussion from the chat, right, about non-coding contributors, which I think is super interesting, and especially how this relates to visibility of the work, maybe funding of the work, how it relates to paid contributors, unpaid work. Um, there's some work in this area, but I think a lot of more things to be done. So here's a question, Christian, from somebody in the chat. Uh, Josh is asking, if you think that language around volunteering and donating puts off contributors who aren't already financially secure, I don't know. Um, I think this is interesting. There's a huge amount of literature on volunteering more broadly, right? Philanthropy. And this attracts a certain kind of people, um, not everybody. I don't know. I think this would be an interesting thing to, to study in. Um, there's a lot of studies on motivation of open source contributors, right? Um, like from this scratch your own itch to um, see this, seeing this as a career path, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. And I think some of them don't interact well with donations, right? Kind of being, be begging for money. Um, you might be better off at least taking the money completely out of it and completely seeing this as volunteering. I don't know. Do you have a thought? No, not about this specifically, but I do. We have seen that the language people use in their um, front page readme files or things like this, the stuff that people see the first time they uh, they come across a project, that that makes a difference. That sort of it, the perception that readers or viewers of these things um, form is influenced by the kind of language and how welcoming it appears. Um, in the interviews we've done, we've even seen that people go through 
I don't know, like issue discussions and things like that. And they try to get a sense of how welcoming the maintainers are. And so if it's worth their time to try to engage or, or things like that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if this also makes a difference because other kinds of language we do see that, that make a difference. I'm not entirely sure what the alternative is to volunteering. I mean, through language around volunteering, if you want people to kind of volunteer their time, right? So you can probably phrase it a little bit differently, but... I don't know, bounties? I mean, then you're bringing in money, right? And bounties are gamification, but not really a serious income um, most of the time. I haven't seen anything um, on incubators. Actually, there has. I think um, one of my colleagues has looked at the Apache incubator specifically. Um, I'll see if I can dig up some published research on this. Um, I, I could think of at least one study that looked at this. I don't know the details um, off the top of my head. I'll need to check. But let me do that and get back to you on the on the notes here. Perfect. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I can find it in real time, so I might have to do it offline. But...